Hi, Sasi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And how are you? I'm fine. I'm well, thank you. How are things in Singapore right now? Actually, the situation is much better now. Uh, what we call phase two, where people are actually allowed to go out and actually do stuff, so which is uh, kind of good. Businesses are back to normal, but I suppose life is not back to normal because we still have to walk around with a mask and also can't congregate in large groups, sure. which is a bit of a challenge for, for me because I'm in the sports industry and you know, as you know, sports industry, we gather in large groups and that's what makes it special. So sure. I suppose in that sense, it's not back to normal, but I'm, I'm grateful that we can actually get out of uh, the house and we can actually interact with people and, you know, try and get life back to normal. So yeah, grateful for that. Wonderful. And it's, it's great that at least the, at least business is uh, back in Singapore. And I mean, I was there a couple of years back and I know how thriving, you know, the city is with everything, you know, going on. So that's Yeah, it's, it's a good place. It's a good place. Economy, um, I suppose in the last five years hasn't been uh, what it used to be before. Right. A couple of challenges with the country, you know, like any country that grows fast. Uh, outgrows itself so uh, th there are a few issues we just came out of an election about a week ago mm -hmm. um, so we're still fresh with uh, a couple of um, I would say shocking decisions but yeah but that's that's life we get on with it you know as an entrepreneur you see different situations different climates you adapt sure. and move sure I mean nowadays every, almost every election has a, a shocking decision so um, yeah you're right so, um, okay, let's get started. Why don't you tell us about your journey? I'm, you're a professional footballer? Yep. So I was a professional footballer. Yeah. Um, so if you allow me to, to go back in time and tell you exactly how I started. Um, I come from a family of five. I have two other siblings. I'm a middle child mm -hmm. and uh, come from a very humble background. My dad for most part of his life, career, working life, he used to work in a shipyard and then uh, moved out of that and then became a, a, a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so ours was, like I said, very humble beginning. Um, we didn't have the luxuries growing up. So it was always, we we're not in poverty, but we, you know, we had just enough. And sometimes when you look over the fence and you see other kids enjoying the best things in life, you kind of wonder why it's not you. Um, so I, I suppose I kind of grew up with that attitude of, um, you know, wanting to be something more than what we, we actually had. Right. And I wasn't the greatest in school while I, I knew I could actually do stuff, but I wasn't like a, a brilliant student, but all my energies were channeled into sports. Yeah. Um, are you picking up the, someone cutting trees behind me? Uh, yes, a bit. You are right. Yeah, this guy. Hang on one second. Let me see. That's fine. Now. Yeah, there's there's a guy right outside my house uh, trimming the landscape. So I suppose it's going to be like that for about maybe ten minutes. One one second. Let me see how far he's here. Yeah, I think it's going to be about another five minutes. Yeah. Uh, what do you suggest we do? We want to. Pause this for a while and then let him go away and then we can. So like I mentioned, I was an academic in school, but I channeled all my energy towards sports and started getting really good at, you know, playing sports. And my first love was actually field hockey. I was playing hockey for a long time, mm -hmm. but I also was playing, playing football for the school team, got better. And um, I was fortunate enough to lead my, my school team into the national uh, games after I think 20 over years, I was a captain wow. and I took the team to the next um, next stage and eventually got picked for the Singapore schoolboys team right. that was traveling yeah. to, to, to Bangkok. So things happened fairly quickly, went, made the team, went to Bangkok, came back, uh, local clubs started looking at me a bit more seriously. I was a, probably one of the younger talents coming through. Sure. Um, did that and then played for a semi-professional team um, just before I entered army. And yeah, you know, but then my, my football journey started, my professional football journey started then. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, so talk to us about uh, how the footballing culture is in Singapore and in general, the sports culture. Well, I suppose 
if you are going back in time, when I was growing up in the, I suppose in the 80s and 90s, yeah. and even up to early 2000s, the football was uh, pretty much part of everyone's life. It was right. the, you know, the culture was great because everyone was looking forward to the weekend where the team, the Singapore team was playing in the Malaysian League at the time, which, right. uh, you know, caused huge rivalry and stuff like that. So every boy growing up, dreamed about being a national team player playing in the national stadium with 60,000 people every weekend right um once they did a survey of uh, the number i suppose that every ambition of a young kid and right. every boy wanted to be a footballer not a doctor lawyer mm -hmm. uh, or an accountant so or a banker so i was no different uh, you know i was pretty much part of the era where f football was big and sports was i suppose uh, the, the rising star uh, as the country was also developing. Right. Um, yeah, so it was, it, was, it was great. It was a great era to grow up because there were so many sporting heroes that I had, um, yeah. especially of Indian origin, that we could easily identify. And as a young, young kid playing in your own backyard or with your friends, you start you know, imitating those guys. Like You want to be like them, right? Yeah. Every move you make, you follow, <laughs> follow what they do and stuff like that. So yes. I would say while we had a very... Um, very ordinary, very humble sort of a childhood. I thoroughly enjoyed being on the field, playing sports because that was my escape. Wonderful to hear. Wonderful to hear. And it was interesting uh, when you mentioned that every kid wanted to grow up to become a player, uh, a Singapore player or, you know, playing in one of the leagues in Singapore. In India, we have players growing up wanting to play in the EPL. <laughs> so is, is that, uh, I mean, uh, don't uh, players also want to be part of the, the, uh, the Premier League as well? Or, um, I mean, they've built such a strong brand that um, people just want to play for Singapore. Let's not forget that I grew up in the era there was no cable TV. Ah. So the Premier, League, the Premier League wasn't prevalent as then. We only had uh, what we call Road to Wembley on a Sunday morning. Right. Where it was a rerun of one of the games. So I suppose the kids growing up now are very fortunate, and especially not just in India, but around the world. They got eight or nine games they can watch on the weekend. And it's just okay. not, not Premier League. They can watch Bundesliga. They can watch uh, Spanish La Liga. They can watch Italian Serie A. They can watch all sorts of games, right? Sure. So I, was, I would think that we could only watch was live football and I was at the stadium. So I suppose we grew up in two different eras or the kids now have a lot more option. Uh, right. Let's not... You know, I forgot to throw in YouTube in the mix where of course. Um, a lot of the kids are picking up skills and tutorials and stuff like that. I, I wish I had all of that when I was playing. Right. So, um, so you're saying the culture has changed and now the pop do you say the popularity has gone down of uh, Singaporean leagues? So, I suppose when you got options and when you got good options, right. what you tend to do is you start gravitating towards the uh, um, popular consensus, right? In the sense that it's more glamorous to be a Manchester United, Liverpool and Arsenal fan than being a fan of a local football club. Of and course. I'm pretty sure this is, this is uh, pr uh, prevalent anywhere in the world. Of you course. see that, uh, you know, especially in Asia, everything is compared to the Premier League, right? right? Whether uh, the guy is as good as Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi. Right. But there's two different things, right? It's completely two. You're comparing, you know, apples and pears. But uh, fans being fans and kids being kids as growing up. And I've got two young boys who are also playing competitive football. And, you know, they follow different things. But I try and drill into them that, you know, you can support Liverpool. You can support Manchester United. But you also must support your local team because that's where um, your roots are. And, you know, you need to be supportive of those uh, local talent as well. So... Uh, whereas it's not the same in many households and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I played the game here right. and I want my kids to follow the same footstep in that sense of supporting local. Right. It's uh, very, very different in different households. And, and that's, that's the problem for a lot of, uh, I would say, countries in Asian football because even if you look at the, the biggest leagues in Asia, mm -hmm. Japan, Korea, um, even in China, you see the popularity of the game dropping, right. especially from a viewership is because kids would rather be watching the Premier League, then watching the Chinese Super League or the Singapore League or, you know, even ISL. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the popularity of the leagues go up the moment they open a big, uh, former big player like an NES star or, uh, you know, one of the stars. 
I think that's also their strategy, right? A very clever strategy of saying that, okay, if you can't fight them, you know, join them. So, you know, not too long ago, I actually helped one of the clubs here, was owned by one of my friends here, um, to bring Jermaine Pennant. You know, he was yeah. um, a Liverpool himself. player, yeah, Liverpool player, and he was also man of the match in one of the Champions League games. So, right. when we brought him here, all of a sudden, we tapped on the ready Liverpool fan base that was here, which is about 300,000 people. Right. So, I suppose now is for teams in this region to be smart about how they attract fans instead of fighting why don't you then align with what is popular sure so i suppose i suppose that's the challenge and not many clubs are willing to do that i don't see that enough but i suppose the japanese um league and a couple of the leagues have tried to crack the code and you know they they, they get good results in the end sure but do you think marketing and branding is an issue you know, when you look at uh, football across Asia, yep. there are some clubs that take marketing and branding very seriously. Sure. And there are some that just take it by the way. Because they see it as a cost. They don't see it as an investment. Right. And these are two different things. When you see it as a cost, that's the first thing you'll cut when you don't have money. Definitely. But when you see it as an investment, that's the first thing you'll do when you have to cut costs because you know that your brand will stand the test of time. Right. But unfortunately, team owners and I suppose administration, management, they see that as a luxury, which is, um, which is quite sad. But uh, there are some that are completely different on the, on, the, on the spectrum. They put everything into brand and marketing. And that's the reason why you see they are successful commercially, which then translate into sporting success. Definitely. Definitely. And... Um... I'd like to backtrack a bit, if you don't mind. Um, I want to talk to you about when you were growing up, where did studies come into the picture? Like, well, of course, you're pursuing a sport professionally. Did you have to keep up with your studies? You know, I mentioned this before. I, I wasn't the, the smartest kid in school, but yeah. that, that's not to say that I, I, was, uh, I was completely useless. Um, I was very good in some subjects. For example, like geography, because I had an interest in geography. I wanted to travel the world. So I wanted to know locations, countries, capitals. And especially during geography class, I, my, you know, I would perk up. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed English, right. you know, like, because I love to read. So literature and all that, I really enjoyed doing those stuff. But when it came to stuff like math, I had no, no clue. I had no interest in math. Right. But... You know, over the years, being an entrepreneur, you must know numbers. So I became better in that. Okay. I put a lot of uh, effort into it. Um, stuff like science, I didn't really care about science, chemistry, and, and physics and all of that. I, no, it was not my thing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at overall education, they kind of shoehorn into saying that you got to know all these nine to be, to be a great person, you know, useful okay. in society, which is such a backdated uh, notion. Sure. Um, and... Funny enough, I actually did my master's in sports management about seven, eight years ago right. and have been um, nominated to do my PhD as well uh, wow. by the dean, so I, which I decided not to do. But if you ask me when I was in school, in secondary school, that I will go on to do my master's and, and actually be in, in contention to do a PhD, people will be laughing, like right. they'll be thinking I'm mad. But people def they are developed differently. And I'm practicing that with my own kids. I right. suppose this pressure of being great in school and trying to balance education and sports, it's a, again another preconceived notion that that's the only way to success, which right. I can kind of don't subscribe to. And we've seen it over time and it's been proven time and again that you don't have to take the conventional route. There's always an alternate career. Right. There's always a different way to do things. As long as you get to that destination, but how you get there is it's uh, everyone's own uh, journey, right? For sure, for sure. So, um, what happens, I mean, in India, I can uh, vouch for, is that, you know, there's no certainty when you get into professional sports because um, in India, especially, the money is so low when it comes to sports apart from cricket. Right, so they have to have studies as a really strong backup option, which hampers the progress of the of the person pursuing the sport. You know, he has to take breaks during, I mean, for exams to prepare for exams, and then 
you know, as as you are a professional uh, footballer, you know that you know it's the details, right? It's the extra effort put in that will help you. Uh, that will help take you to the next level. And then here, people don't get to take those extra steps because of studies. You know, I think we got to look at education um, based on what's its purpose. What's its purpose, right? The purpose of education is to prepare someone for certain thing. That's why that's what purpose of education is about. Sure. So the current education around the world is quite rigid in the sense that you can only do one thing at a time. It means either you study or you don't. Right. There's no such thing as you can study and then try and be excel at sports. Right. The current system just doesn't allow that. And that's one of the reasons why parents are very reluctant to to ensure that the kids are, you know, you know, play sport. So I think it's about time that we really looked at that. I, I'm not advocating that kids don't go to school. Right. Um, I'm far from that. In fact, I actually encourage people to go to school. But what I really think is that the development of a child cannot be based on one system that fits all. We are all unique in our own ways, the way we learn, the way we develop and stuff like that. And especially an athlete is special in the sense that they have a special gift in being good in a certain sport. That doesn't mean that they are not academically inclined. In fact, to play sports at a very high level, you've got to be smart. Especially if you're a footballer at a very high level. People say footballers are stupid, which I don't agree. If you play at the highest level possible, you have to think so fast. So in terms of your brain processing um, cap capability, you're actually an academic, right? Yeah. It's just that you're not applying it in the right place. And then the society turns around and say, hey, you know what, you're not that great. So what I would really like to see in the future and we're already seeing some change now. We have a, a specialist school in Singapore, which is called a sports school, where they allow the kids to develop in a different format. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, the rigid system where you say you go to school at 8 o'clock and this is what you do. In fact, what they do is they, they wrap around education based on their training, sure, which is beautiful, in my opinion. So I think what you really need to give an athlete is the flexibility to learn um, alongside their sporting I suppose, uh, excellence. You see that a lot in the US. You can see that, right? They, especially right. when you go to college sports Sporting. and stuff like that. Right. The reason why they excel is that they kind of tell you that you can play sport, but you need to stay in school to keep you in sport, right? So they kind of correlate each other, but they also allow the flexibility to learn in different ways. Right. And I think that's not mainstream enough, especially in places like Singapore and India, mm -hmm. where there's bits and pieces of people trying to do that, but they, you know, again, trying to change the education system is a taboo first. Sure. And there's a worldview that you need to spend hours and days and years and decades to change. Right. But people are in small pockets going to change that. And I think in the future, I mean, especially with this whole thing that's happening throughout the world now, right. nothing is a guarantee. If you're a banker, it's not guaranteed. If you're a lawyer, it's not guaranteed. You're a doctor, no. okay, I suppose the kind of half guaranteed. But any other thing, any other job, you tell me today that any other job is safe? Sure. No, no I, job I, is I don't know. I don't. I, I, it's it's really apart from probably you know Amazon, like the delivery service. Apart from that, I mean yeah, very tough. So, so I was, my question to you then is, uh, when you're growing up, are you gonna? I mean, if you told your dad or mom that I'm gonna be an Amazon Amazon delivery driver, what would they say? <laughs> <laughs> right. you, you can you can be whatever you want, but uh, not as our child. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So, but then in this pandemic period, these are the guys that actually survive. Right. So does that make it right or wrong? You know what I mean? So I, I suppose the way you look at things have to be completely different, different lens, different worldview, but that will take time. It will take time to change. But I think slowly people are waking up to the fact that that's not the only way to do things. For sure. For sure. And um, yeah, and of course, uh, athletes inherently are really sharp, you know, because of the sport uh, of sports usually so they pick up information much quicker than you know uh, the average person so it it you know they just need that backing to be able to study at their own time and you know i'm sure they do great so the the question here is to ask what makes an athlete special right, right. i think the, the reason why athletes are special is because their ability to be coached right right to be coached. So that's to say that you can actually get their attention. They're willing to follow um, rules. They, 
willing to follow your strategy you put in. So why do they not then follow um, rules in school? Sure. So it, it shows that they're actually not interested in the subject. Mm-hmm. Because once you're, you're interested in, say, football or hockey or whatever, cricket, you are ready to move mountains to follow your coach's instruction. Definitely. Right? So, so the, the clues are already there. I think what they really need to do now, the education system, is to see how every child is unique and how we can actually get them to be interested in the certain topic and stuff like that. In fact, somebody once told me, he said, I wasn't bad in school. I just didn't find the thing that I was going to excel in. Right. You know, which I thought was really profound. Right. Definitely. And um, yeah, so, okay. So you move on from being a professional footballer and you get into entrepreneurship. Yeah, I mean, I had a very good football career. I won many titles. I played for the national team. Um, you know, I played over 35 times for the national team. Oh, wow. I had 12 years as a career as a professional player. I quit quite early. At 29, I quit because I kind of disillusioned with the whole idea of being a professional footballer. I knew that I was an accidental footballer. That's not really what I wanted to do, right. even though I had a passion and dream to do that. But once I got into it and achieved the things that I wanted to achieve, then there was nothing else left for me to do. And I know that this career is not going to be forever. I had to look at other things to do. And I've always had this entrepreneurial streak in me in the sense that even when I was playing, I invested my money into an events management company, learned the ropes, you know, being part of that. My entrepreneur journey actually started when I was actually 15. If you give me 30 seconds to give you a brief story about how I started, is I and a couple of friends came together and we put on a party. We wanted to sell tickets, as all teenagers do. We wanted to be popular. We wanted to create the most popular party right. and bring people in. Uh, but that was a disaster. Nobody turned up. There was a fight. We ended up being $800 in, in debt. And mm-hmm. $800 for a 15-year-old is uh, almost $8 million, right? So yeah. we, we, luckily enough, one of, the, one of the boys, the parents were well-to-do, um, and they were entrepreneurs. So they kind of uh, wrote off the debt, even though we were working at McDonald's to pay them off. Yeah. They're very kind to, to recognize that we wanted to be entrepreneurs. So I always, always had this entrepreneurial streak in me, just that I didn't find that you know, level 10 opportunity to jump in. So when I, when I finished playing at 29, I had an opportunity to move to Australia. I was actually part of an agency that was dealing in you know, sports marketing. I had a, you know, Melbourne was my, my home base then. Loved the city, so much of sports, a great place to, to you know, start, set up my second career. Yeah. Did that for a year and, and uh, you know, did some really cool stuff there. You know, just before we started recording, I told you we worked with Greg Chappell, right. who then became the coach of India. Yeah, we did, did quite a few things there. And then I came back home because I just got married then and I left for Australia on my own two weeks after. Mm-hmm. So it's like going for a honeymoon without my wife, which is not <laughs> the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I came back and she was running her own business, family business. So I decided to come back home and be next to the family. And then I applied for a few jobs. Uh, unfortunately, even though I've done some good work in, in the past, um, I would say 12 to 18 months, people were not willing to take a chance with me in Singapore. So I said, if I'm not going to, you know, if I'm not going to get the job that I want, I'm going to create it myself. And that's when I started a company called Red Card. Mm-hmm. And um, I started off being a football agent because that was a low hanging fruit. I understood the space decent recently well and you know i would say that because there was a lot of um, gaps in terms of dealing with agents 99 percent of the agents are all unscrupulous uh, they only think of money they don't care about the player yeah. so i wanted to do something different i wanted to be the guy that actually cared for players and it was not so much about the money but is to give them a proper guidance and and, and good experience so that you know i can carve myself out in that space right. so i ended up managing about 40 players only to realize that the industry is the way it is. It's because of both the buyer and the seller. So it means to say that the players are as bad as the clubs that sign them. So I couldn't kick my grandma for a dollar. And there was a lot of dodgy deals going on, which I couldn't be part of. I didn't see myself being part of that murky world, even though I must say that not all the agents are like that. Um, I've met one or two that are really true to their, to their core. And that's the reason why they are not football agents anymore. <laughs> because they, 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 they couldn't sell their soul. So I, I kind of pivoted the business. It was really tough in the first four or five years, just trying to make ends meet, you know, and questioning myself whether this entrepreneurship route was my, 
my calling in life it was hard. But like anything, you know, football actually taught me to be resilient, determined. I know that I will turn the corner. Yeah. Um, and I did. And I did. After five years, we started doing some really cool stuff. The team expanded. Then we went into multiple regions. I worked on some very high profile projects that put us on the map. And uh, in the end, you know, from being a one man, one table in a co-working space, we became almost uh, 60 people. And the company was valued at 10 million before it was acquired. Wonderful. That's, that's amazing. And um, I, ha- I had a follow up question to this. During your entrepreneurship journey, like at the early years, were you making a lot of money? <laughs> Let me tell you, you, you have to be extremely lucky to be making money in your first three years or five years as an entrepreneur. That's the reality. Mm-hmm. I think a very small percentage of people um, get going straight away and you know start making money and, and, and they become rich fairly quickly. Right. Every big story that you know, and right now I'm actually listening to an audio book um, called Shoe Dog, which is actually the life story of uh, Phil Knight, the guy who invented Nike, right? Or the fellow who started Nike. Yeah. And in chapter one to I think would have been seven or eight, in every chapter, he talked about every week going out of business. Like bankruptcy was around the corner every time he said something about his company. Sure. Uh, and today, Nike is one of the foremost leading brands when it comes to sportswear, right? So uh, the reality is that I couldn't, I mean, I resonated with that so much that you know, I'm recommending this book to, to all my the people that I mentor. So you've got to read this book because it's a very, very lonely road being an entrepreneur. And I believe that, you know, you've got to have, you know, the, the mental capacity of an entrepreneur is unbelievable. You've got to be resilient. The reality is you can't talk to anyone, especially if you're a single solopreneur or you're, you're the guy that owns the business 100%. Right. Because you can't talk to your wife because she's going to get worried about what's happening. Right. You can't talk to your parents because they will be worried about, you know, your well-being. You can't talk to your staff because they will get worried what's happening to their, you know, their salaries in the end of the month. Yeah. So it's a very, very, very lonely journey. And I won't wish it upon my biggest enemy. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think it's also at the end of the day, it's a very fulfilling journey in the sense that if you created something out of nothing, you become the 1%. Sure. 1% of the world's population that creates things. Right. right? And, and, and I've always wanted to be the 1% that you know, worked um, on my own terms, did the stuff that I wanted to do and enjoy the work, right? So I have a lot of friends who are lawyers, doctors, and they keep looking at me and they're going like, you know, I'm really, really jealous, Sasi. Mm-hmm. They go like, um, you know, I'm really jealous with the work you do. You know, you, you know, it's such great work and stuff like that. We hate our jobs. And these guys are all well-paid lawyers and doctors. They've got, you know, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, big houses, but they hate their jobs, right? They hate their jobs. They hate getting up, you know, on a Monday morning to go to work. I, I mean, I'm completely different. I jump out of bed and I'm saying, what am I going to create today? Sure. Uh, I can decide to wear shorts and, and, and flip flops. Or I, if I want to go to work in a suit, I completely decide my own destiny. Right. And I, I won't pay. I, that, that's, I think, suppose it's the best part of being an entrepreneur. The price you pay for freedom mm-hmm. and the, the ability to impact the world the, the way that you want to impact, I think it's, it's so beautiful. Right. And, and I can't preach that enough to people. Sure. Sure. And do you feel, I mean, a lot of people have this uh, preconceived notion that, you know, um, they'll get a job, they'll make a lot of money, and then they'll get into entrepreneurship once they're secure. And uh, do you think that's like a good strategy? And can people go about it that way? So I think there's no right or wrong to do anything. Mm -hmm. I think we can't be binary with the way we're thinking. In fact, I actually encourage people to do that. Right. When you're young, especially when you're in your 20s, go and learn. I think that's the best way to learn. Learn at some at somebody else's expense, right? You go into a company, a small company, which is one of the reasons I always tell people not to go and join a big company because when you are in a huge company, you become one of many, sure. right? And you don't really learn a lot. You're just kind of you know a fly on the wall, just learning and just doing bits and pieces. The real... Um, experience comes with going to a very small company where they bootstrap everything. It means to say that you get a chance to taste everything. Like you are in the front end, right? You are really in the action. You're in the deep end. And they're actually paying you to learn. How beautiful is that? Mm -hmm. Right? 
So you're honing the skills, you're understanding the, the industry that you want to be in and you're making connections at somebody else's dime. Right. So it's almost like going to university where the university is actually paying you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. To yeah. do your work. Right. So once you have equipped yourself with say five, six years of experience or even longer, and when you have some sort of capital to tide you over for maybe say six to a, six months to a year, right. where you know if you even absolutely don't do any business, you're still going to be okay to pursue your dream. Right. That's the true liberation. I think that's the real strategy that you should be looking out for. Um, that's why I, I kind of explain to people to say that, you know, in your mid-20s, early 20s, mid-20s, go and work for someone. Right. Look for, look for a guy that has done it, like your version of what you want to be when you're 30 or 40. Sure. Right. And do everything you can to get a job with that guy. Mm -hmm. And then not just as a boss, but get him on as a mentor. Right. Right, stay next to him. So, uh, in my own journey, I look at a lot of guys that have, um, who've passed through our our agency over the last fifteen years and have gone on to becoming some very very successful people, um, working with some of the biggest organizations, and they still call me boss, right? Right. Um, the, because the reason is because I don't hold back when I teach. When they're right. part of my organization, they are small, so I I let them do everything, right. and 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 that's that's been our philosophy. So I would say. Coming back to your point where they should actually work and, you know, yeah, I'm absolutely in for that. I think in your early 20s, that's what you should really be doing. Sure. Sure. And um, how much do you hold back when you are starting out? Especially, you know, everyone has this um, idea that their company is unique in, in a specific way and nobody should, you know, compete with me. And how much do you hold back information from... Uh, you know, employees or interns who you assume that they may be your competition in the future? The, the reality is that I used to think like that. Right. In the early years of my business, I used to think, I used to have this scarcity mindset where I was afraid of loss. I was afraid of um, a lot of things holding back. Right. Um, that's not true liberation. I think that's, that's actually a very counterproductive and that's very unlike a, a leader to do. Right. right? Um, People appreciate respect and want a very authentic leader. Right. And that's one of the reasons why politics sucks because a lot of the leaders are not authentic. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and in, this, in the world of leaders today, you see that a lot of them are not authentic. So, and the moment somebody authentic comes along, people are magnetically drawn towards them. Right. The breakthrough came for me when I kind of lost that scarcity mindset and I say I have an abundance of mindset. Meaning to say that if I lost a business today, I have the ability to pick up another piece of business in one week. Right. Because I have the belief in myself and the ability that I bring something unique to the world. You should only be afraid. You should only have that mindset when you don't have the ability to replace what you lost. Sure. Right? So to me, I turn, I turn that around in the sense that, no, I can't have this scarcity mindset of to say that I'm going to hold everything back. Of course, there are a few things that you will not share openly with the world because that's some, sometimes your intellectual property or that's actually your, your trade secret or your financials, which you know you don't need to share with, you know, uh, maybe say an intern, right? right? You don't need to share because it won't make sense for them and then that's actually not even their scope of work. Yeah. But if, if, if you're empowering them to be the best version of themselves and then you're withholding information, then 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 it's, it's bad on you, right? right? So I suppose anybody, if you look at anybody in your own circle and you see that the guy has a scarcity mindset that he doesn't share, he's selfish and stuff like that, you know that the person doesn't go too far in life, mm -hmm. right? Success don't, don't come to people with that kind of mindset. You need to have that growth mindset. You need to have the mindset that you're willing, willingly to share things and stuff like that. So I'll give you a, a very prime example, even, about, even in this, right? Yeah. Um, I get I get requests for a lot of uh, podcasts. People want me to come on the podcast and share my stories. Um, so I, I don't even ask. I mean, as you would know, I didn't even ask you what's your your listenership or you know right. how many people download this. I, I just don't ask because that's not the point for me. My, the point is that after somebody listens to this podcast and one person takes away one thing and impacts their life, right. I, I suppose this podcast has done its job. Definitely. So I come with a sense where, and I have this abundance mindset to say that if it fits into my schedule and if I can afford that, that one hour sitting here and talking to you, I'll do it. 
uh, it might not be this week, but next week, but down the line, I'll definitely be able to time, find time. And that's how I've always kind of um, gone about with my life to say that, you know, always have that ab- abundant mindset. Like, you know, whatever, whatever you give away comes back to you in tenfold. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, talk to us about the sports industry and entrepreneurship in Singapore. How is the market? So, many years ago, there was a very vibrant, I suppose, um, a startup ecosystem in the sports space. A lot of agencies started sprouting out. Mm-hmm. Uh, local agencies started sprouting out because um, you know the government basically came out to say that in 10 years, um, sports will contribute 2% to the GDP of the country. So yeah. everybody got excited. We knew that, okay, this is the way to go. But over time, that kind of changed because right after the Youth Olympic Games, we hosted in 2010, yeah. the organizers, the government blew the budget uh, over 300 million. And then it became a sore, sore point for a lot of the people here. Like, say yeah. you've gone over budget and stuff like that. And uh, so in a kind of a knee-jerk reaction, what the government did was they started slowing down on a lot of the major events that the country was hosting. Yeah. I suppose not enough um, funding was channeled into creating the ecosystem. Yeah. And then we also didn't take advantage of the youth hosting the Youth Olympic Games to build the ecosystem locally. A lot of it was um, dependent on bringing international consultants, international agencies that would know enough transfer of knowledge and technology to grow the local ecosystem. Right. So over time, what has happened is that the, the, I, I suppose the government has also thought that, okay, it's not going to contribute to the GDP. We let, let sports take a backseat. Uh, the ministry in charge of that also changed its name and dropped the sports. It used to be called Ministry of uh, Community and Youth and Sports. Right. And they changed it to Ministry of um, uh, Culture and Youth, dropping the sports. Okay. So, so that was a kind of a signal to the industry to say that you know you're left on your own, you're on your own now. Right. Um, but that didn't stop us. I think there were a couple of of people still pushing on. What happened then is we used Singapore as the base, uh, purely for credibility, respectability, and of course the tax structure yeah. and the corporate structure to be here was quite favorable. Yeah. But the real market was outside of Singapore because we are one hour away from Indonesia where it's, where it's about 250 million people. Yeah. If you go up north um, to, to Vietnam, there's another 90 million people. Um, then you've got uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. So you, the Southeast Asian market was vibrant and it was growing at a breakneck speed. So everything within one hour. So a lot of the companies, especially us, what we said, okay, let's base ourselves here, but we, we do regional work. People trust us. There's a certain level of respect and credibility for Singapore companies. And that's what we did. We built a business at the back of being based in Singapore, but our market was never Singapore. Interesting. Interesting. And what happened over time that now you see 15 years on, there's only two local agencies. In fact, the other agency that was our competitor over years and started around the same time have actually uh, kind of shrunk into it in, in terms of shape and the stuff they do. And they completely pivoted the business away from sports. Right. Hmm. Okay, that that's interesting. I mean, you've used Singapore as a focal point, and then because there's so many countries around it, you've been able to get. Yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I think also uh, um, one of one of the good things that, um, like I said, right with the with the Singapore passport, you don't have visa restrictions to travel anywhere. Right. <clears throat> that gives you the flexibility to 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 stay let's say in Indonesia for maybe a, a four weeks, five weeks, and then you know mm-hmm. from there travel. So. The, the mobility with our passport or what the, the country has given us then allowed us to be very inventive business people to yeah. go into marketplaces where we now can bring our expertise, our, our Singapore DNA to tap on the market. But it's easier said than done, right? Because you're not native in that country. Of course. Of course. So then we needed to strike then local partnerships and, and hire local staff which then in return helped the economy in that country grow, but unfortunately it didn't grow in Singapore. You know, the ecosystem didn't grow in Singapore. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I'm sure you've learned a lot over the last 15 years. And um, how is the sports tech landscape 
do you see potential um yes i do i come across a lot of um on a daily basis i come across a lot of requests for me to be either uh, an angel investor with them an advisor a business mentor consult them mm -hmm. right for growth and stuff like that i see that on a daily basis not just local but international companies yeah so so much so that the space is becoming very crowded um and you know everybody's doing their own thing coming up with a tool or a product you know right so i i see that happening a lot more and i think post covid is going to be interesting to see who can last the pace because as you know in tech you need a lot of cash to burn sure to get to a level where you are viable so while it's dynamic um i suppose there will be some aggregation of the marketplace um mm. but what i i really like to see are tools that can really help people grow but not just be part of the ecosystem for the sake of being it because uh, mm -hmm. i've seen a lot right uh, an app uh, a software which just adds more and more cost to uh, the end user sure so i suppose uh, if an organization now has to subscribe to 15 to 20 different software tools and whatever they are using apps and if somebody can super aggregate that and become the go to for everything and charge a fraction of that price i think somebody like that will actually win it interesting interesting and um do you need a lot of cash to get started though absolutely not mm -hmm. um there's a there's a there's a are you talking about sports tech or which space are you looking at sports or in business in sports tech sports business in the sports industry So let's just take one of the things that I teach. I teach um athletes and anyone to start a sports coaching business in 7 days. Okay. Okay. So my promise is that you will not spend a dollar mm -hmm. to actually get started. So I have a three step system. Yeah. Um where it's broken up into about nine mini projects. Mm -hmm. and in 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 7 days you can get started and in 60 days you'll be actually making money Wonderful. so this 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 whole exercise only requires you to basically have a um i suppose your laptop or even a phone mm -hmm. a internet connection and obviously being part of my program and that's all the investment you have to make mm -hmm. and you can actually Uh, start doing uh, in terms of 2 or 3000 dollars in 60 days. So yeah. I've kind of taken all the stuff that I know over the last 15 years, created a very simple uh, no brainer step by step, you know, templates day to day what you need to do, what sort of mindset you have to have because a lot of the time it's the mindset that kills people. Sure. It's not so much about actually what they do because uh, doubt creeps in. So if you don't master your mind then I don't think so you are prepared for business and that's mm -hmm. what I've learned over time. Right. So there are simple exercises to future proof yourself, future pace yourself to say okay this is what I want to be, how do I reverse engineer? Um so I'll give you a simple thing. If you want to earn 2500 a month, mm -hmm. let's say doing sports coaching, right. you must know simple things like who am I going to coach? How much am I going to charge? And right. how many students I need to make the money? Right. Right? As simple as it may seem, a lot of people actually don't do it or don't know how to do it. Sure. Right? then then you find like okay so i've got that now like what's what am i best at doing so uh, yesterday example i had a friend who who been to india to uh, learn yoga and she came back and she texted me over and said you know what i want to be my own boss but i don't know where to start right. i said start by asking who needs you most mm -hmm. right who need you most she said people who vibe with me i said that's that's a <laughs> uh, that's a that's a character you can't by just looking at your hair and your your eye color and your body i can't say who you are right i i need to know what are your attributes um are you a male 45 or are you a male 21 do you like yoga do you like football do you like i need to know that so that i know how to engage with you you can't tell people by their character yeah. so a lot of people what they do is they start a business by, by saying that my ideal client is based on their character that's why they fail but you need to find out who your clients are or ideal clients are by the attributes so that you know where they hang out what they do so for for example i think just before we we got on the call you talked about how to get to parents of course so instead of looking at their characters let's talk about the attributes where do they hang out right um maybe they might not be hanging out in the sports but they might be car buyers 
Uh, mm. They might be part of a social group. Right. Um, they might uh, like a certain brand, right? These are all touch points. So yeah. what I do with my, my, my project is, my program is that I actually teach people how to do all of this stuff. So I've got a membership uh, site uh, that, uh, you know, they pay on a monthly basis where, you know, there's community that builds around there where like-minded sports coaches come together and, and learn from one another. And I, and I do coaching there yeah. and also have a one-to-one coaching that I do. So when you, the question to ask to say that, do you need money to start? Absolutely. No, in this, we live in the greatest time where the internet, you know, even the internet is free. If you go to Starbucks, right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and you've got a phone, everyone's got a phone. Even if you don't have, you can sit on a terminal. There are free terminals anywhere you go. Yeah. Right. So, so there's really no excuse that to say that I don't have resources. It's about being, being how resourceful can you be? Sure. And uh, yeah, so before we be, uh, end this podcast, uh, are there any barriers to entry? Um, no barriers to entry. I think the barrier is yourself. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest fight is with yourself, your, your mindset, you know, the way you look at life, uh, the way you look at a certain task. Starting is always the hardest. Yeah. And, you know, when, when, when you look at a task, the thing becomes overwhelming because you, you, you feel that it's a lot of things to do. My advice is to break them down into micro commitments. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, getting up in the morning and saying, I'm going to read one, one chapter of the book on entrepreneurship. Start right. there. Right. Right. So, so breaking down large daunting task into smaller pieces and attacking that in one day at a time will get you closer um, to your goal. I think the pain of not doing, the pain of regret is larger than the pain of actually doing it. Wonderful. Doing something. Yeah. So, right? so that's, that's how I live my life. Yeah. Wonderful. And thank you, Sasi, for such wonderful insights into your life and your profound knowledge around around entrepreneurship and basically sharing your experience with all our listeners all over the world and um, no it's a real pleasure thank you for thank you for having me and you know i'm always happy to share you know like i said i i want to put you know information like this so that people can take action and then you know they can find the better or the best version of themselves definitely most definitely so Sasi, where can people find out more about your about your consultancy business, um, your startups, and uh, how can they get in touch with you? So you can actually check out the Sports Business Mentorship Program on a website called www.sportsbusinessmentoronword.com. You okay. can go there and you can see what we do. You can uh, get in touch with me on uh, or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Blade of God. So I'll say that again, at Blade of God is my Instagram and uh, Twitter handle. So you can connect with me there. I share thoughts about life, about sports, business, entrepreneurship there. Or you can actually email me, sasikumar at redcutglobal.com. And, uh, you know, get in touch with me on all these places and, you know, ask me for help. Uh, be part of our, our programs. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that people get a lot of value. People change their lives, the way they think and stuff like that. So I work with, you know, athletes and, and sports people from around the world mm-hmm. while i'm seated here in the u in, in singapore I, I impact people all over the world which is something that i'm so grateful for and i want to com- continue doing that i have a mission to 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 help at least a thousand coaches get into the sports business in the next eight next 18 months so if you're one of them if if what i said just resonates with you just uh, get get in touch with me there's lots we can do together wonderful wonderful and those who are probably driving or walking and don't have a notepad we have all the links on the show notes so please feel free to check them out and directly get in touch with sasi for your help and queries so sasi thank you so much and we hope uh, we can have you in india soon and you know collaborate and talk about sports entrepreneurship further for sure it'll be my real pleasure take care thank you